Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Connor Best, and I'm Director of Global Marketing for Napa Valley Vintners. NVV is the trade association representing more than 550 wineries in the Napa Valley, banded together to promote, protect, and enhance our region. For all you California folks, including our two winemakers, wondering why you're up so early? Well, this is, truly is a global show. We have 177 people RSVP'd from 27 countries. And we wanted to time this so that trade from Canada, the East Coast, um, Europe, and even Asia, I know it's late at night, but even trade from Asia can be joining us live. So thank you, for, um, no matter where you are in the world, thank you for joining us. The goal of today's session is to provide an overview of the subregions of the Napa Valley to help members of the trade like you sell our wines. Napa Valley is complicated with 16 different sub AVAs, many of which share common characteristics with other regions as well as specific differences. We aren't gonna cover all of the AVAs individually, but we will cover different groupings of the AVAs to help you make sense of the different areas and to talk confidently about the wine styles coming out of these different areas. We've asked two prominent winemakers who make wines from many different parts of the valley to share their opinions on what makes wines from these different areas of the valley unique. This is the third in a three-part series on selling Napa Valley wines, including an overview that we did on March 2nd, um, an overview of the region, and then a discussion of our varieties. All of these and more are posted on our Napa Valley Sessions page, which you can find at NapaValleyVintners.com and just look for the Napa Sessions button to bring you there where you can also RCP for future sessions. All of this is in support of a new program that we're doing called Hopwine. Hopwine is an international virtual trade show um, uh, where, where producers can come together with trade to meet each other, to share information, and also actually request real wines to taste at your home. So if you are an importer looking to expand your portfolio of Napa Valley wines, please visit hopwine.com, register if you haven't registered already, and go browse, engage, request wines, and meet 23 Napa Valley producers who are looking to do business with you. The fair ends tomorrow midnight Paris time. So go on as soon as you're done with this session to, to start browsing our wineries. Today's discussion will be led by Jackie Bleason, one of Canada's newest masters of wine, recognized for her achievement back in August 2020. So hi, Jackie, thanks for being here. Jackie's an independent wine educator, writer, consultant with over two decades of experience in all facets of the global wine industry. She's the first master of wine from Quebec and one of 10 from across Canada. So one of the, one of the few, so thank you so much. Jackie brings an incredible amount of international experience to today's discussion. She lived in France for 11 years where she was the UK and North American export sales manager for Burgundian fine wine brokerage, Domain Wines, and also a major Southern Rhone um, producer, Gabrielle Meffrey. Since returning to Canada, Jackie has focused on consulting and education and her recent clients have included California Wine Institute among many others. So Jackie, just first question for you. How many times do you think you've visited Napa? At least five or six times. Five or six times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, you have a, you've been there enough. I know I met you the first time. I think it was 2016 on an yep. MW study MW trip where we hosted you on a couple study days in the Napa Valley. So fully confident. I know you know the Napa Valley super well. So excited for you to lead this discussion. So take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's joining us here today. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be joined today by two illustrious panelists uh, who I will introduce now and tell you a little bit about their backgrounds. So Keith, if you could come on screen, Keith Emerson, a winemaker for Robert Craig Winery. Keith has 20 plus years experience as a winemaker, especially in the Napa Valley. Consultant winemaker for Robert Craig, also with a couple of other wineries and making his own wines as well. Produces wine in Napa, Sonoma, Oregon, Santa Cruz, uh, potentially other places I might've missed out, you'll tell me. 
Um, Keith has a, a Bachelor of Science in Enology and Viticulture from the University of Davis in California. And he is really going to be our specialist today on the upper valley floor and especially the mountain AVAs that we're going to get into a little bit later. So Keith, if you want to just give us a little uh, quick overview of uh, Robert Craig Winery. Absolutely. Thank you, Jackie. And a uh, pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so Robert Craig Winery, Bob Craig is the is sort of a mountain pioneer around these parts. And uh, he worked in the 80s for the Hess Collection up on Mount Veter. That was his first uh, job in the wine industry. Um, Bob helped establish the Mount Veter AVA, actually. And, um, and then several years later, helped establish the Spring Mountain AVA as well. Um, so a real mountain Cabernet pioneer. One of our pioneer, mottos at yeah. Robert Craig is um, wine with altitude. So um, we make a lot of wines from, from several mountains around the valley. Um, we're a small, small winery doing about 10,000 cases a year, perched at 2,300 feet up on the summit of Howell Mountain. Okay. Um, so there's been a lot of snow up there the last few, last few weeks um, with these rainstorms. It's, it's snowing up there, you know, uh, up on the mountains, up on the, the tops at least. And I think um, that'll surprise a lot of around. listeners today who just typically think that the Napa Valley is, you know, hot Mediterranean area. So that's yeah. going to be really interesting to get into a bit later. Thank you, Keith. So yeah, our second uh, panelist today, John Emmerich from Silverado Vineyards. Hello, John. John is the winemaker at Silverado. It has been since 1990, so a real expert. Uh, BS in fermentation science from the University of California, Davis in 1987. Uh, he's worked at Stag's Leap, at, at Con Creek, at Sebastiani, uh, harvested in France, all of this before joining Silverado. So he, John also brings us a wealth of knowledge and experience, and he is going to really guide us through the southern Los Carneros, the southern part of the valley into mid-Napa. So welcome, John, and please give us a little overview about Silverado. Hi, welcome, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's always fun to talk about wine in the Napa Valley. Uh, Silverado Vineyards uh, established in 1981, so we are celebrating our 40th anniversary, which is uh, pretty amazing it to is. think about. Um, we were actually started um, by the Miller family, who are still uh, the owners of Silverado Vineyards. We're family owned and all estate group. So we have six vineyards throughout the valley. So. What's really unique about that is we get to work with a lot of different appellations and grapes grown in those appellations. And Silverado, I think, is really known for their single vineyard wines, which uh, we're going to talk about some of those. And we've got some great images to show as well. So that's going to be super. So what I'm going to do is to kick us off. So I'm going to give us a very brief, I know a lot of you know the basic facts about Napa Valley. So I'm just going to give you a very brief sort of top line facts about the Napa Valley. And then we're going to get into this discussion. We're going to separate out the valley into different areas so that we can sort of get our heads around these 16 AVAs. So I'm going to share my screen now and we'll just have a little overview. Here we are. Here we go. So the Napa Valley. So as you can see, the Napa Valley, as you know, is in Northern California. It's located 50 miles north of San Francisco and about 35 miles east of the Pacific Ocean. So despite its worldwide recognition, it's actually quite a small grape growing region. It represents about 4% of Can uh, California's annual wine harvest and a mere 0.4% of the world's wine production. There are 475 wineries in the Napa Valley, 95% of which are family owned. So even some of the larger names you can think of are generally family owned. And about 80% of Napa's producers are producing less than 10,000 cases a year. So a lot of small production happening. There are over 30 grapes. The Mediterranean climate that we'll get into in a second of the Napa Valley really allows quite a wide diversity and also the topography, the different altitudes, the different orientations that we'll dive into, allow quite a wealth of grapes to be grown, over 30 grapes. Um, the most prominent obviously being Cabernet Sauvignon, 55% of production is Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Merlot, you can see on the screen, Pinot Noir, these are the big grapes grown here. And when we talk about the style 
of wine coming out of different parts of the valley. We're going to focus mainly on Cabernet Sauvignon, just to give you a benchmark of how the style varies from one area to the other, except in the southern reaches, obviously, where we're going to talk a little bit about Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So there are, as Connor mentioned earlier, 16 AVAs. Um, Napa Valley has 18,600 hectares in all, 46,000 acres for our American friends. Um, and the Napa Valley is bounded by the west, as you can see, uh, by the Mayacamas Mountains. And this sort of is a barrier on the other side, you find Sonoma and then the coast. So it protects uh, to a certain degree from the coastal weather. And then on the other side, you can see that the valley is bounded by the Vacas range. So sort of two mountains, this narrow valley situated in between. The vineyards range in elevation from sea level to about 26,000 feet, 800 meters. Um, and the valley floor is about 30 miles long and just five miles wide at its widest point. Uh, the 16 AVAs, you can see they're sort of um, delineated on the screen here. And they each have quite uh, different mesoclimates, altitudes, orientations, soils, and we're gonna get into that today. Now, AVA, it's important to remember, American viticultural area. It's not exactly the same as a French AOC or an Italian DOC. It's a geographical origin, but it, there's no rules set on the grape varieties that you need to grow, the viticultural or vinification practices, the yields. It really is more to do with origin. So this is a great shot. So this is typically a Mediterranean climate. So when you think of California, when you think of the area, yes, it is very, it can be very hot. Summertime highs can get up to 80 Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius in the southern part of the valley. Uh, and in the northern part of the valley can get as high as 35 degrees easily Celsius in the summertime. However, there are a few really important mitigating factors to this um, warm, sunny Mediterranean climate. What you can see in the photo here is this fog that settles down. Um, and this fog essentially in the hot interior of uh, California, hot air is rising in the afternoon and it's drawing in this uh, cool, these cool fogs and breezes. Uh, and they're coming in from the south, you can see on the bottom of the map, um, on the side map there, uh, the extension of the San Francisco Bay is called the San Pablo Bay. That touches uh, almost the lower part of the valley where around the Los Carneros area. And that brings in the fog. And in the north of that, the valley, we're going to discuss a little bit later on around Calistoga, a gap in the mountains, the Chalk Hill Gap. And these are two areas where uh, fog can sort of creep into the valley, cooling the temperatures quite significantly overnight so that at nighttime, you can have an average temperature of around 12 degrees, whereas you had over 30 degrees during the day. So really significant diurnal variation, hot days, cool nights, which really allows quite ripe, uh, really uh, bold wines to be produced, but with beautiful refreshing acidity is where the balance comes in that's so important. So it's quite a lot drier in the southern part of the valley around Calistoga, uh, gets about 450 to 600 millimeters of rain per year, whereas in the north, uh, especially Calistoga and some of the mountain areas, quite a lot rainier, over a thousand to about 1500 millimeters of rain there. The Napa Valley has extremely diverse soils. They're of volcanic and marine origin for the most part. There are half of the world's 12 recognized soil orders, 33 different soil series, and over 100 different soil variations in the Napa Valley. Um, the valley was formed by tectonic plate movement. It's quite complicated. I think we'll leave it there, uh, given the timing we have today, and volcanic activity. And the subsequent erosion and intermingling, intermingling uh, has led to sort of different soils in different areas. And we talk about on the valley floor, valley floor pardon me, more fluvial soils. So silts and clays that are deposited along the riverbank as it flooded and receded. Um, this is on the valley floor, as I said, these are deeper, more fertile soils. And then alluvial soils. So these come from alluvial fans of gravel, sand, silts that are washed down from the hillsides to the valley floor. So these affect sort of the bench lands, these lower slopes that are going up towards the mountains. And then on the higher reaches in the mountains, you get into some mountain soils. And these are the breakdown of more primary bedrock. They're rocky soils, they're shallow, they're nutrient poor. And we're gonna discuss a little later on what this brings to the grapes that are grown here. So now we're going to 
deep dive into our first overview. And so we've pulled up a couple of Google Earth images so you can get a, a sense. This is Napa Valley looking northwest over the city of Napa. And what we're going to do is we're going to start. So just here you can really just get a sense of the valley floor. You get a sense of the mountains, the Mayacamas, the Vacas, um, and sort of how the valley sort of uh, travels from south to north. This next shot, we're going to start in the south, move up the valley floor, and then into the mountains. So we're going to start. This is a, a shot essentially over Carneros, looking north. And so starting with Carneros, this is where John is going to be my, my guy, my expert. And uh, so Los Carneros, southernmost Napa AVA, zero to 200 meters of elevation. It's quite a cool area, breezy, obviously dominant marine influences we talked about because of its proximity to San Pablo Bay and the Petal Petaluma Gap to the west, quite low rainfall. And essentially, how do these factors that I just mentioned, John, how does it affect the wines that are made here? And what style would you say is most prevalent? Obviously, we're going to pro primarily talk Chardonnay and Pinot Noir since we're in Los Car Carneros, but what are right. your, your feelings, your sentiments about what really embodies Carneros? Right. So again, it, it's that proximity to, to the San Pablo Bay that is really... I think for me, the major influence that uh, you're gonna see, it's it's cool down there and we have fog and there's a lot of good sort of moisture in the air. So that really helps retain that really great bright acidity that you really, in my opinion, you wanna see in Chardonnay and in um, Pinot Noirs that are grown there. And there are other actual varieties, you know, that people are growing down there, again, that they're trying to really retain that acidity. And to me, that is probably the most dominant influence of uh, what's going on. And you can see this is um, uh, our Chardonnay vineyard. So there are hills as well there. I mean, not major topography in the sense of when you get up valley, like uh, where Keith is and Howell Mountain in that area. But uh, again, it kind of, the fog just really kind of rolls through there during the summer and really keeps things pretty cool. Uh, much cooler than uh, even mid valley. It can be 10 to 15 degrees cooler down there oh, wow. on, on any day. So um, again, you know, you sort of hear winemakers talk about hang time and things like that. And, what, what the coolness allows is just for us to really have slow, uh, more controlled ripening and really, get, again, giving us control over when we want to pick. Right. Um, we really, for Silverado, we're really focusing on pH. pH to us is really important, particularly with our Chardonnay. We want to keep the pH fairly low. Mm -hmm. and Get that acid balance right. Frequency. Yeah, exactly. And so if I were to say to you, John, I've never had a Chardonnay uh, or a Pinot Noir from uh, Carneros from uh, Napa, what, what, what does it taste like? Just sure. you know, if so, you were to generalize. Right. So I, I'm not going to speak about Pinot Noir because we don't make Pinot Noir. Okay. So Chardonnay. Uh, I don't think that would be fair to me. Uh, to, to speak on behalf of Pinot Noir. Um, but for Chardonnay, I think some of the general notes, we there's kind of this tropical character, um, golden delicious apple, uh, sometimes a little bit of Meyer lemon zest, uh, orange blossoms, a little bit of honeyed, honeysuckle notes. So it's very um, aromatic, sort of bruised, uh, fruit kind of way. And um, again, for us, we're really trying to retain the acidity. And depending on vintage, uh, we may um, try to use a little bit of malolactic to give us a little bit more creaminess, as an example. I mean, there's so many ways that uh, you can make Chardonnay, and there's just this really wide gamut of, of styles coming out of out of Napa, but Carneros in general tends to be a little brighter, acid, mm -hmm. and more vibrant. 
more vibrant, more vibrant and more you know, just 10 that, year brighter yeah, acidity. That mineral, people talk about mineral and slate, hot okay. rock, those, those kind of components. Interesting. Yeah. So if we were going to move up into your, the heartland of Silverado, yeah. uh, here we're looking at uh, Coombsville yes. uh, facing the Vacas Mountains. And right. so in talking about, so we've essentially decided to group the southern, you know, we started with Carneros, now we're moving up into the other southern Napa Valley AVA. So we're gonna, here we're going to talk about Coombsville, Oak Knoll, Yontville and Stags Lake District where your winery is located and here we're still seeing uh, you were mentioning when we were chatting the other day we're still seeing the significant cooling effect from that proximity to San Pablo Bay uh, but here we have valley floor sites and we are starting to get into some bench land um, so quite a lot of difference in, in terms of orientation are we west are we east so quite a lot of difference here um, if we start with Coombsville what for you really um, sort of epitomizes Coombsville? What makes it different? Why, why does it deserve its own ABA? Sure. Um, well, again, you know, I have the, the great sort of honor and pleasure of being able to work with a lot of different AVAs. Mm -hmm. And to me, when I go and taste other producers from Coombsville as a whole, they seem to be the most similar of okay. all the so it's really interesting to me. So nice consistency across Coombs that you feel. Great consistency, I find. And to me, what I'm seeing is uh, really that great mid palate texture. Okay. That I think is very, very unique. To, and why do you think that is in Coombs Oh, uh, the soil to me, I think, I, I really feel like the soil in that area is much more uh, uniform. Okay really driven by volcanic and okay. um, there's not a lot of sort of marine and I mean there's obviously some alluvial but it's it's really more volcanic and that's mm -hmm. pretty that's pretty uniform and then again of course the weather uh, being or you know the fog uh, coming coming in and out but uh, not some pictures cool. here of your yeah. So again, there's there's a little bit of um, elevation. Again, not yep. not significant. I wouldn't consider it significant, but uh, you can see, yeah, here it is. And that, you know, again, you can kind of see where the fog line uh, is. And this is uh, this is an old dormant volcano actually that never erupted, just sort of leaked. And uh, so you can actually find chunks of uh, tufa and that to me is really what informs this area. So we have uh, obviously still with this cool area still some lovely Chardonnays coming out of here but if we were to focus on Cabernet Sauvignon we said going north we would sort of as a benchmark use Cabernet Sauvignon what makes a Coombsville Cabernet Sauvignon different from something I would find in other parts of the valley? So again because it's a little I would consider it more of a cool climate um, Cabernet Sauvignon, there's a little bit more, in my opinion, of an herbal note in the aromatics. Um, and that does translate a little bit into the palate. But again, there's this vibrancy that comes in. But that mid-palate texture is really amazing. It, it, just, it just is a very long palate. And then it just finishes really smooth. And I just feel like there's a lot of structure going on in Coombsville Cabernet. Right. We'll and it's, not, it's not these huge wines. Right. They're very elegant. And John, if I might jump in and just mention, I think I, I've never had a Coombsville Cabernet that is drying or tannic. You know, they're all, like you said, they just carry and they're long, generous. So when you say uh, uh, so the tannins are quite, are quite velvety, you yeah. would. Yeah. Okay, velvety tannins, an herbal note you were mentioning, and that lovely mid palate, mid palate texture. So moving, so this is the uh, southern Napa Valley, looking uh, out over the city towards the north, obviously. And uh, so now we can have a conversation now about uh, Yonville, about Stag's Leap, um, and get into other parts of this southern stretch of the valley where we're still feeling the cooling effect. But obviously, as we're moving north. Uh, less and less so. 
So this is uh, from Stag Sleep, uh, looking out over Yonville. Maybe we can quickly touch on Yonville before we move back into this lovely sort of separate little side valley we see that makes Stag Sleep so special. And um, so I think we have a lovely picture here of one of your Yonville um, so that is here. Um, if, if I can shamelessly uh, promote uh, a little bit of our wines at Silverado. So we do, we make a single vineyard Cabernet that comes out of the Coombsville area called Geo, G-E-O. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon and it's, uh, it's fantastic, if I may say so myself. You may. I made it. Um, okay, so Yonville is super interesting because um, a lot of the soil here to me is really informed by the river, the Napa River, and how it has flowed and overflowed. Uh, the soil here is, is mostly clay, so it's okay. pretty deep and uh, really retains moisture. So for me, and I know a lot of people grow Cabernet in Yonkville, but in our particular site, it's just, I don't feel it's appropriate to grow Cabernet there. I feel like the soil is too deep and mm -hmm. dense. So um, Cabernet doesn't like to have wet feet. Yeah. yeah so we Florida. actually grow Sauvignon Blanc, which is a vigorous variety and it does extremely well there. So you're looking, what you're seeing is actually um, post-harvest um, of our Sauvignon Blanc and you can see it's in a wire system. So it's pretty vigorous down there. And it's great for so long because, you know, it likes to throw crop. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. So the clay soil, so you, you, you feel like it's, uh, it, does that give a certain roundness to those that are growing Cabernet Sauvignon Yonville? Does it give it a, a fleshier feel to it? Or? I think for the folks that are growing Cabernet, they're probably finding little patches that have more um, alluvial fan. A little bit, right, a little bit more gravel. Really, they're trying to find the gravel spots. Okay. Kind of what you see in Bordeaux, you know, where there's certain areas where there's little Outcrops. more. Outcrops. Yeah. Of and course. My feeling is that's probably where they're putting ca uh, Cabernet and the Bordeaux red varieties. But for us, again, ours is pretty consistent. It's mostly clay, and I, I just feel like it wouldn't be appropriate to try to okay. grow cabernet there. That makes sense. Well, yeah. then why don't we jump over into uh, Stag's Leap so we can see this flat area of Stag's Leap, but then we've also got the Palisade effect in Stag's Leap that's quite interesting. This right. valley floor to about 123 meters of altitude, the slopes, the alluvial fans. What can you tell us? Quite a unique um, sort of AVA sub area. Uh, what makes Stag's Leap so, uh, so unique, so different from the rest of the valley? Um, well, again, this, this AVA to me is just so fascinating because literally we have a vineyard on the west of the Napa River, which is our Yonkville, and directly yep. across is our Stag's Leap. Okay. But the soils are so different. And the soils are formed from sort of volcanic and rock and it, the, those those hills that you have seen Go back to it yeah mm -hmm. buffed off and informed the soil right so they're really um much more volcanic alluvial and there's there's not as much clay so again really great to grow cabernet mm -hmm. although early in the history uh when uh people were looking and defining areas based on temperature uh, the joke is Stag's Leap was thought to be too cold to grow. Okay, because you're still getting quite a significant effect oh, of, the, of the fogs. and the... Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I really feel like if people have been to the Napa Valley, the Yonkville Crossroad, which is about a mile north of our property, seems to be this really interesting dividing line where it just starts to get warm. Right. Okay. And uh, or warmer, I should say. You can see this is the winery yeah. um, where we make everything. Uh, this is the backside of our property. And you can see the tree line. That, that's the Napa River right there. Right, okay. And the other, Yonkville's on the other side. But... Yonkville, our Yonkville property's on the other side. So okay. you, you can see that. You can see, again, there's some elevation, but it's just 
more, um, it's more volcanic. And so the vines struggle a little bit. Um, and, you know, but we get that cooling effect from the fog in the mornings and that shift again from midday to evening can be 15, 20 degrees. I mean, it's amazing. And so if I was blind, if you were blind tasting different AVAs, what would make you pick out Stag's Leap District? I think the two things, again, the structure of Stag's Leap wines, there, there tends to be a little bit more acidity and the tannin structure is much smoother. And the fruit component coming off, there's not as much as of an herbal note as you would see in, in uh, Coombsville. Yeah. It's more of a sort of red, like a Bing cherry kind of note, kind of a very bright, shiny. If you think of something like a shiny red apple. Sounds good. Yeah, doesn't it? It does. So this is your Cabernet Sauvignon vineyard. Yeah. This is the same vineyard that we were looking at? And yes. So again, okay. you can kind of see the hill, the, the slope. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. So I think that we're going to move into the mid valley here. So you can see quite flat on the valley floor here. We're moving into the mid valley. And so mid uh, Napa, we're talking specifically about Oakville and Rutherford here. So still a slight cooling effect, but less so than in the Southern Valley. So we're more of a moderately warm area. Um, as we said, this fog effect lessens, this cooling effect lessens as we're moving more. Slightly more powerful, fleshy, charming wines if I were to um, generalize, but I'll let John and Keith talk about that a little bit more. Um, so we're really gonna discuss with these two AVAs, the difference between the valley floor sites, because it looks very flat, but there are these higher bench lands. Um, and then the difference, a very important difference between the east facing and the west facing vineyard sites in terms of sun exposure. So uh, I'm going to leave this open to both of you. I know, uh, John, you have some experience with Oakville, maybe Keith jumping in more on Rutherford, but if you want to jump in and talk together, that's cool as well. So maybe we could start with Oakville. Um, you know, tell me the main features of this, of this vineyard area and the wines coming from it. Keith, do you want to jump in or? Sure. Yeah, All absolutely. Right. So, um, you mentioned some of the benches, and I think that's really important when you're talking about Oakville and Rutherford. Um, there's some wonderful sites on the Western bench. Um, yeah. very Can you notable. just explain briefly for somebody who didn't understand exactly what a bench meant? Sure. Yeah, it's it's almost like the foothills. It's just okay. at, at the bottom of each mountain, it sort of gradually goes down in, in uh, elevation. Right. And when you're sort of at the bottom of the mountain, but not quite down to the valley floor right. at um, sea level, you know, you're in some some prime spots. Some of those alluvial fans that you were mentioning before mm -hmm. are located on those benches. Uh, there's usually a lot of rock and some great drainage along those benches. Uh, so the, the Western Bench has a lot of notable vineyards um, that many folks have heard of, and uh, like the Coquillon Vineyard and things like that. And then the okay. Eastern Bench um, coming down from the Vaca Mountain Range has more of the volcanics that John was talking about. Um, and so I find some real prime, prime vineyard locations on both benches, uh, west and east. And then as you get closer to the river, closer to the valley floor and onto the valley floor, the soils generally um, get, they get a lot deeper. Um, there are some little, little gravel deposits here and there that John was mentioning where you can really find some prime, prime vineyards down there on the valley floor. Usually there's a lot of rock in those vineyards. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're closer to the river, then you're, you know, you're talking more about Sauvignon Blanc and um, maybe um, larger production, um, uh, larger yielding Cabernet vineyards, um, maybe going into um, bottle prices that are not quite as high as some of the mountain vineyards or some of the Benchland vineyards or the Stag's Leap vineyards. Okay. So uh, just, but the wines coming out of Oakville and Rutherford in general, um, to me, they're very generous. They're very, um, they're, they're fruit forward and um, the tannins are usually quite resolved, sometimes juicy, fleshy fruits, um, beautiful reds and blacks and purples. And, um, I really like those wines. They're, they're typically very drinkable upon release um, and then can have the structure to age well uh, also. So as you go up in elevation a little bit, there are some higher elevation Oakville and Rutherford vineyards, and those are intense. Those are more similar to the, to the mountain vineyards that we're discussing. So do you find that when you're, uh, if you were to be tasting these wines blind from east to west, a really significant difference in terms of acid structure? And I see John nodding. Yeah, I do. Yes, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Um, again, I, 
for me, those two regions, particularly Oakville and Rutherford, um, the 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 bench lands or the you know kind of the the foothills as as Keith are are so to me significantly different than when you get to more of the valley floor. Um, they they just the, the fruit just grows differently. Mm -hmm. The valley floors they're just a little bit more abundant, more vigorous, uh, yeah, vigorous. Mm -hmm. um, I had the good fortune of being able to work with um, Cabernet from Tokolon Vineyard, which obviously most people know about, very famous vineyard, um, through UC Davis. UC Davis has a research station um, there where they do a lot of, of course, viticultural uh, experimentation. And we were making uh, a little bit of wine for the university and, and for a wine club for a while. And the tannin structure is so different coming out of Oakville and Rutherford than even Stag's Leap. And it takes five minutes, 10 minutes to drive from Stag's Leap yeah. to the. So, Fascinating. again, you're just looking at how soil and yeah. even that little difference of weather. That, yeah, that mesoclimate difference is, is affecting the wines. That's amazing. We could stay here for hours, but I think that we need to move up the valley floor a little bit now. Um, so here we are moving up. We're looking at northern Napa from sort of above St. Helena. So this is St. Helena and Calistoga. We're going to focus on this now. Um, this is the warmest part of the valley, making the, you know, the ripest, more powerful styles of wine. Cabernet Sauvignon, Zinfandel Syrah, Petite Syrah, these are the sort of things growing here. Um, and we do, but we do have when we get into Northern Calistoga, a cooling effect coming from the Chalk Hill Gap. So Keith, if you could sort of walk us through um, these, these uh, the areas of St. Helena, these very hot valley floor sites and the sort of particularities that make them unique. Yes, absolutely. Um, I love the St. Helena Appalachian. It's really interesting. and. If you're looking at this particular map, just down to the very, very uh, left corner, the bottom left corner, yep. um, those are some prime spots over there. Those are extremely gravelly, rocky. Uh, we call that Western St. Helena. Uh, but those vineyards over there, uh, those are going into, you know, two, three, four, five plus hundred dollar bottles of wine. Those are those are pretty amazing. It's it's very, very shallow. Um, okay. And there's sedimentary uh, gravels. Exactly. There's a reason there's a quarry right over there. Um, there's okay. just a ton of rock. Yeah. Uh, and then, so that is a hot site for sure. When yeah. I pick any of the vineyards that I have over there, it's, you know, early September type of ripening. Yeah. So we're talking early ripening cab. Uh, and then uh, as you get, you see the town of St. Helena, and then you kind of go across to the right on this map. Those are warmer vineyards as well, um, right. sort of St. Helena proper. Um, and then you see how it gets narrow. That's the, the narrowest part of the valley is uh, mm -hmm. Deer Park Road. And so there is actually like an hourglass effect of wind and air that goes yeah, through you there. Yeah, see that. Keeps it the, relatively cool. Yeah, there's a lot of great vineyards there on the um, on the western bench and also up on the eastern bench that actually benefit from some of that cooling. And um, and so I would say that's a little bit of a cool pocket up valley. I mean, as you go up valley, it gets warmer in general, but there are some cool pockets. And then it so opens back up again. And as you get up towards Northern St. Helena and Calistoga, then it opens and widens and gets hot again. And those again are earlier ripening vineyards. Um, there's all kinds of, there's some deeper loamy kind of clay loamy soils closer to the river. And then there's a lot more volcanics as you go east up towards the Vaca mountain range. And then there's a lot more alluvial fans as you go west up towards the Mayacamas. So lots of rocky influences and volcanic influences uh, with a tiny bit of elevation. Uh, but then down the middle is more deep and fertile uh, Cabernet growing areas. And the, uh, the cooling effect, so Calistoga, obviously the hottest, hottest part during the day of the valley floor, but then this cooling coming uh, from that gap in the mountains, the Chalk Hill Gap, um, really dropping those nighttime temperatures. Do you really get a sense in the acidity of Calistoga that differentiates it from St. Helena? I do, yeah. It's a different fruit profile entirely to me. Um, I think the Calistoga wines, just in general, they do have good acidity, but they're um, they're they're big. They're they're very okay. very powerful, and very ripe in my opinion. When you say fruit profile, you just mean ripeness, or you mean the type of kind of fruits? If I was if I was putting my nose in the glass, or... uh, ripeness and and darker to me, darker riper so. and more of a, a black fruit profile. Okay, and Saint Helena more of a mix. Saint Helena more, I get more um, sort of. Uh, 
I get violets, I get some purples, uh, blues, I get, um, I get graphite, pencil lead, scorched earth, you know, things like that. Interesting. Yeah. There's, yeah, it's, it's amazing how, even as you're saying within St. Helena itself, just really where you are, east, west, the different pockets of gravel, how much the wines can change that you can't even within one AVA uh, say this is exactly what it is. But for the purposes of, of trying to wrap our heads around the AVAs, we're, we're generalizing today. Um, and so from moving up the Northern Valley, we're going to go next into the mountain sites. And you, Keith, you provided me this great map which talks about, so obviously we're going to separate the mountains. Uh, obviously they're quite different on the Western and the Eastern mountains, but just to start off the common features of these mountain sites, first of all, this higher elevation, so cooler temperatures, obviously, but being above this fog line, which you show so well on this map and on this beautiful shot here as well, that's lovely. Um, and so how does that affect, uh, if, if we're sort of generalizing mountain AVAs, what are those common features that make it different from valley floor sites? And then we'll jump into the east-west. Sure. Yeah, just in general, I, I think mountain viticulture is pretty amazing. Sometimes it's kind of extreme. I find myself on very, very steep slopes quite often, and um, I'm glad I have a big four by four, that's for sure. Uh, there, <laughs> there's several blocks that you just have to take an ATV into. Um, but so for me, it's the, the growing season starts later, you know, bud break is much later. And so there's not... I don't, I don't know of a lot of mountain vineyards that have frost protection either. You know, they, they just, they don't need it because by the time the buds break, you know, it's pretty much springtime and we're not worried about frost up there. So the temperatures up there are colder in the winter for sure. It's, you know, it's raining here. It's probably snowing at Robert Craig right now I'm down at the valley floor. Um, and so it's, uh, it's definitely colder in the winter. Um, takes longer to get going. And then once it does get going, because we're above the fog layer and enjoy these kind of warmer evenings than the valley floor does sometimes in the summer, and it get to enjoy sunshine while the valley's still under fog until 11 a.m. or in the sun, you know, that allows us to catch up. I think the mountain vineyards play a lot of catch up. Um, okay. They do, in general, have a, have a uh, later ripening uh, window than the valley floor. That's very general uh, in terms of Cabernet. But, um, but at the same time, they get, they get a chance to catch up on those warmer evenings and uh, being above the fog on those mornings. Absolutely. And so you've got this, uh, this effect of uh, these, also the soils, these, these shallower, more nutrient poor soils that are giving you these, these smaller berries, these more compact, concentrated flavors. Is that, would you say yeah. that's right? Definitely. And thicker skins too. Um, okay. They, uh, the, the skins of the grapes up there are tough and hardy and thick, and they handle a lot of wind, and they handle that, um, you know, that exposure, sort of that rough um, uh, climate. And I think the thicker that that's skins are getting a lot grippier tannins, I imagine. Yeah, it's you know, it's um, there's there's a lot there, and I think as a as well, John as John would probably agree, we have a lot of options when the grapes get into the fermenter. Um, with, with mountain Cabernets in general, you want to be careful and be, um, and don't overdo it. Don't over extract because that power is there in the skins and you just want to make sure you're judicial <laughs> and not too, you know, not extracting right. too much. Fair enough. All right. I'm cognizant of the time. I think we're going to go over a bit, Connor. Uh, but if we're looking now, so this is, um, looking East from spring mountain over St. Helena to Howell mountain. And so I think we're going to start here on these Western mountains that are Eastern facing. So they're getting this abundant morning sunshine, but they're shielded from the hot afternoon sun. We've got Mount Veter further south then spring, and then there's a gap, then Spring Mountain, then Diamond Mountain. Um, and these mountains are situated from sort of 120 to about roughly 800 meters in altitude. Um, and what would you say if we were sort of talking about these three areas, Mount Veter, Spring Mountain, Diamond Mountain, I realize they're all quite different, but the Western mountains in general, how would you sort of define them in terms of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon styles coming out of the Western mountains? Sure, I'll, I'll go as fast as I can and start from the mm -hmm. South and work North. Um, so the Mount Veter Appalachian, one of your original maps shows how long it is, how it goes from South to North and it's quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of acreage and miles there. So the South part of the Mount Veter um, Appalachian is cooler, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, long hang time, slow ripening. As you get north um, in the Mount Veter Appalachian, it gets a little bit warmer and things ripen a little bit earlier up there. But in general, there's a ton of evergreens up there, a lot of protection um, from wind and from airflow and things like that. 
Um, there's enough airflow to, to keep things healthy, but, uh, but relatively protected. Yeah. Um, those, yeah, those, um, those vineyards typically hang uh, quite late into the season. Uh, at least ours do. So we make a, a Mount Beter Estate Cabernet at Robert Craig from our Amentet Vineyard on Wall Road. And then you jump a little bit north to Spring Mountain. And um, the Spring Mountain to me is probably the coolest of the mountains. Um, for me, it's the last thing we pick just about every year from our Crowley Vineyard up on Spring Mountain. And it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of, as you're driving up Spring Mountain, there's a lot of little creeks and there's a lot of water activity. They don't call it Spring Mountain for, the, for no reason. It's, um, there's springs. I'm right here at the bottom of Spring Mountain right now, and there's okay. springs coming down all season long. There's a lot of water activity coming down the hill. Um, there's a lot of water up there on Spring Mountain and um, a lot of ferns and things like that. And again, the vineyards are very protected um, and very sheltered. Uh, but that's a longer growing season. Those wines are intense. They have the mountain tannin and power, um, but um, maybe a different profile to me. Sometimes I get a little herbal element up there, which I actually enjoy, um, sort of the dried lavender effect um, with those sort of purpley, uh, really, uh, I think, uh, voluptuous fruits and things like that. Nice. Interesting. Then you get north to Diamond and Diamond gets pretty intense. Diamond is, okay. is warmer and okay. um, it's more typical of sort of Northern St. Helena and um, Southern Calistoga. Um, and then add on top of that, add tannin and add power and add intensity because the Some berries are ones. so small. Yeah, <laughs> the berries are so small and, um, and they have that exposure, you know, they're up there 2000 plus feet and they, um, they just, they're, they're loose clusters, tiny little berries, thick skinned, um, on Tufa, the vineyard that we get for Robert Craig, it's basically like walking on the moon. It's white. It's all that rhyolitic ash and Tufa. And, um, and it, you know, you walk out of that vineyard, you look like you have talcum powder all over you. Wow. But that wine is intense, very black fruit driven, tar, creosote, you know, things like that. Those are intense vineyards up there on Diamond. Hey, Jackie, could I, could I jump in just real fast? Of just course. Um, if our audience indulges us, because I know we're going over a bit. Well, I know. Hopefully I, you're sticking with us. Yeah, so I just want people to imagine if you have a balloon and you know how you can blow a balloon up and it gets larger and smaller. If you think about a berry and where it's being grown in the valley yeah. and that skin versus the juice mm -hmm. in the berry. So think about sort of if you're going up into the mountains, right, the balloon's smaller. Contracting. Yeah. yeah. And so you have a lot more skin to juice. Right. And you go down to the valley floor, your berries might be oh, a little. Yeah. yeah. So again, you're getting juicy, maybe less tannin versus, you know, really intense. More muscular in the, in yeah. the mountains. Yeah. yeah. That's a great so, analogy. Yeah. We're going to carry on in our mountain conversation, jumping over onto the other side. So here we're on the top of, so on the south, uh, in the Eastern mountains, we're talking about Atlas Peak and Howell Mountain. Um, and the most southerly of the two is Atlas Peak. And so this is really looking right down on the Atlas Peak uh, vineyards and then in the background, um, Howell Mountain. So what can you tell us about these two AVAs that are in the Vacas Mountains, Keith? Yeah, uh, Atlas Peak is, uh, is cooler than Howell Mountain just in general. And again, mm -hmm. I think that has to do with being more closer to the San Pablo Bay and more marine yeah. influence just a little further south. Um, those are also long hang time vineyards. Um, anything that I've, I don't currently work with Atlas Peak, but I have in the past and anything that I've uh, picked from, from Atlas Peak has been pretty much the last thing of the year. Okay. Um, yeah. Despite so, those uh, afternoon, uh, beside the Western facing those afternoon sunshine, it's still uh, cooler than you'd find on the, uh, on the other side of the mountains. Yeah. still cooler to me. Um, mm -hmm. You get, you get up to Howell mountain and that's where actually there's some earlier picks for sure. Um, there's some warm pockets on Howell yeah. Mountain. In this general, where it's, you are. Mm -hmm. yes, it's high. It's high. Uh, that's yeah. We're, that's where the uh, the estate winery is, and this is our estate Howell Mountain Cabernet Sauvignon from Robert. Craig. And this is your property that we're looking at here. Yes, we're looking okay. at the at the winery. Um, there's the tasting room in the very front, and then the the home on the left where the the interns stay for harvest, yeah, and uh, and then the winery there in the background. Yeah. And so this so, is the top of the Howell Mountain looking at Summit Lake. So tell us a little bit about Howell Mountain. Yes, um, Summit Lake Drive is the, is the name of the, the road that Howell Mountain, that uh, Robert Craig Winery is on. And you can see why there's a lot of lakes up there. Um, and uh, yeah, they are just about at the summit. There's just one property 
that's higher in elevation than Robert Craig. Um, so we're talking 2300 and as you get out and go to the very summit, there's more like 24, 2500 and then back down again to our other vineyard, um, which is located at about 2200 feet. So uh, high elevation for sure, um, some of the highest in, in Napa Valley. Um, again, the, uh, there's some pockets there where they're more exposed um, as, opposed to, uh, as opposed to Mount Weeder and uh, Spring Mountain. I think there's great exposure and you've got that westerly facing um, aspect yes. for a lot of the vineyards. And that's, those are the vineyards that ripen a little earlier for mountain vineyards are those western facing ones. Yeah. In my experience, they just they have that afternoon, that really beautiful sunshine in the afternoon and things, things catch up to the valley floor and they, and they Quite often, there's Cabernets on Howell Mountain that we're picking at the same time as I'm picking things in St. Helena. So, really, yeah, not quite as long a hang time in general um, uh, compared to the spring and, and Mount Beater sites. Yeah, but they're my favorite. Uh, Howell is just it's distinct. There's a lot of flavor characteristics. It flirts between reds and blacks all the time for me. Um, depends what vineyard you're working with and what block you're working with. Um, but again, the, the, the common trait is that the, the, the skins are very thick and very hardy and, um, and they handle a lot of weather. Um, they handle the elements and the vines themselves, you know, um, having exposure to snow and, and much colder temperatures during the winter. And they're, um, you know, they're, they're in rocky sites and not deep rooted, but I think those roots are firmly in place. And um, I don't think those vines are, they're not, um, they're not, they don't have too much water. Uh, they're struggling for water a little bit. Uh, and always looking for water. And um, there's a lot of rock and uh, a lot of volcanics up there, a lot of red soil profiles up there, so making very distinct flavorful wines. Okay. Well, I think that um, the one last thing that we're going to touch on, and then I think uh, I'll, I'll try and get, uh, allow a couple questions um, because we've been allowed to go up to an hour here. Um, just very quickly, uh, going beyond these Vacus Mountains, what we sometimes forget is there are there is one more AVA and one other sort of growing region beyond in the sort of the eastern hills east of um, the Vacas, the Childs Valley District, and then the sort of the Pope Valley area as well. What do those, so these aren't obviously nearly as high altitude uh, as we've been talking about now, but still uh, hillier vineyard sites. What can you tell us about the Childs Valley area and Pope Valley? Just to finish finish off our tour here. Sure. Yeah. Um, a little bit warmer. So warmer sites, they, uh, they typically ripen a little earlier and um, there's, there's some fertile soils there. You can get slightly higher production. Um, so you can get a little bit better yields from um, just in general for Cabernet vineyards. And um, you can, you can typically farm it at, uh, because there's so much open space and a lot of uniform soils, you can farm it at lower, uh, lower costs than a lot of these nuanced hillside vineyards and tiny little rocky vineyards. It's, uh, it's much uh, cheaper to farm when you have long rows and uniform yeah. vineyards, uh, larger production. Uh, so uh, I think what's great about that area is you're able to produce really beautiful Napa Valley wines, um, but at a lower cost, you know, right. which benefits the, the consumer in the end because they're able to get great wines at lower costs. And do they tend to make the wine separately or use them as a blending element uh, to make a sort of a larger Napa Valley AVA cuvee? Definitely both. Yeah, definitely both. There's, there's several wines that are 100% Pope Valley or Charles Valley, but then there's, they're also used as blenders. Okay, great. That, that area, Jackie, is also, you, you see a lot of Sauvignon Blanc coming out of uh, particularly yeah. Pope Valley. Uh, again, to, to Keith's point, it's, it, it, can be, it can get pretty warm up there. So those early uh, ripening white varieties can do really well up there because you can get some really interesting flavors because um, it can get pretty hot in the summer up there. Yeah, yeah it sounds Definitely. like Wonderful. Well, I think that it gives us a really nice overview of moving from Los Carneros uh, and the Southern Valley floor uh, that the effect of that fog, those cooler areas, moving up the mid valley, Oakville and Rutherford, uh, still a little bit of cooling, but more of an effect of uh, valley floor versus the benchlands, the east and west orientations, slightly more uh, fuller bodied, riper wines into the north, um, St. Helena and Calistoga, bigger, more powerful wines, and then into the mountains where we're getting these more tannic expressions, but with a beautiful acidity as well. 
Do we have any questions from our audience before we thank everyone uh, for joining us today? I think we do. We have one from Robert, and I guess this is it's pretty a, a big question, so may and might um, be deserving of a couple minutes discussion. Okay. Um, and I think for either of our winemakers, but how does your winemaking approach ver vary based on the different ABAs, extraction methods, length of time on skins, timing of press into barrel, barrel program, etc. Um, I know that's like a whole um, lifetime learning there, but I think just in general, how would maybe if you gave it a couple examples by ABA, that would be fantastic. So I, um, Keith, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first and then um, I'll let Keith, you know, take us home here. Um, again, being in sort of a cooler area, um, I'm, I'm looking at a number of things. Again, I'm really being quite aware of the pH um, of, of the fruit, but as you're tasting the fruit, we want to make sure that the, the fruit doesn't taste green. So we're kind of balancing green or underripe characteristics in these cooler areas versus pH to keep that vibrancy, which is, I think, an important trait of the areas. And again, for us, what I really feel like is important is this one-to-one -one juice to skin ratio. And for Silverado, we really don't like to do a lot of extended um, uh, maceration or really sort of brutal pump overs where we're kind of really mixing things up. Uh, it's much more gentle and because we're really looking for that vibrancy of the fruit, which again is par partially because we're in this cooler area that gives us kind of this bright, shiny characteristic. Yeah, and then I'll just add on to that, um, John. That was that was perfect. Uh, I'll just add on that things like temperature um, is really important during the fermentation. So that's one way we can control things. Um, the vessel, you know, we have different types of vessels that we might ferment in. Um, that skin to juice ratio is very important as well. And then I think experience with with particular vineyards and and what they're going to produce and just sort of knowing. Um, the history of the style of wines that they make and the tannin structure and the acid structure of each of those vineyards and each of those blocks is important. John's been with Silverado a long time. I've been with Robert Craig a long time. And having all those vintages under our belt, you kind of know, all right, this block, I can, I can warm that up a little more. Let it go native. Don't add any yeast, any bacteria. Let it go native. I know this block well. It's going to do great. Get it warm. It's not going to be too tannic. Okay, careful about this block over here because this one, this is a beast. You know, we need to add a, a nice a yeast strain that's going to promote fruit and we're going to keep a cooler temperature and we're going to make sure it's not too extractive and not too many pump overs and not for too long. And so just sort of, uh, I think, experience and then all of our little tools that we have. Great. That was wonderful. Thank you, guys. Just to part on a, on a fun note, Keith, you sent me some wonderful photos and uh, I was wondering, <laughs> yeah. who are these guys? We have some friends up on Howell Mountain. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Our Candlestick Ridge Vineyard is just, it takes a dirt road to get down there. And okay. once you're there, you're you're pretty much on your own, except for these guys. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's Gretchen the bear on the left. Um, she comes Wonderful. to pay a visit She's every a once in a girl. while. And then the little bobcat is cute. I see those all the time, but I do not want to see that other cat on the top right. right. No, no, I bet you wouldn't. I have, not, I have not met that one and I don't want to. <laughs> I think this is wonderful because I think a lot of people, if they've only gone through the valley really quickly, they kind of have an image of the valley floor of, you know, limousines driving up it, of it being um, lovely, you know, beautiful, beautiful large wineries and, and seemingly flat areas and to see the wildlife and to see this sort of, you said, small dirt roads and these, these wild areas is, this is another as important integral part of the valley and it's uh, really opens, I think will open people's eyes about the diversity um in terms of topography and all sorts of things so wonderful so thank you Jackie, so much before I'll just we check go i actually two other questions oh, just great. came in that i want to get a chance to pose here one of them came in from sid and he said he asked him what napa ada is benefiting most from climate change and which is having concerns because that's a 
guess that's a common question asked across many wine regions in the world. And before I turn this one over to the winemakers, I'd like to just put in a little thought of myself. I mean, I think across the valley, we're seeing lots of um, uh, changes because of climate change, but not an existential threat at the time. I mean, a lot of changes in viticulture and changes in where certain varieties are planted. And I'd say over the past few years, maybe even a more and more Cabernet and Merlot planted down in Corneros, where, where it was typically more Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, either of you, Keith or John, like to say a couple words there? I'm happy to. Uh, I just in general, I think that Coombsville, if you're, if you're talking, if you're asking about two AVAs, um, I think in general Coombsville is benefiting. I, I haven't tasted better wines uh, out of Coombsville than the ones that are being produced right now. They're delicious and just keep getting better. Um, and and then as far as you know, Calistoga up up at the north, I think with some warmer, definitely some warmer summer temperatures. Um, I have some friends and colleagues that are doing a lot of experiments with uh, vine cooling, misters, um, different types of trellising to protect the clusters from that direct sunlight, uh, and then other varieties and rootstocks as well. So playing with all kinds of stuff up there. Um, so those are really two extremely different um, sites in terms of how global warming is impacting. Right. I, I would just add, I, I think, I, I think wineries, winemakers, viticulturalists are looking at different varieties to see what um, will do well uh, here, perhaps in the future. And you will, I think, start to see a shift in, in some varieties being grown in particular areas where they haven't been grown before or maybe not being grown in areas um, that just aren't suitable anymore. And then there was one other question came in from Will in the UK, and I'll kind of paraphrase his question here, but um, his question essentially is, what are, what's the big difference between the ABAs? Is it based, are they based on climate? Are they based on soil differences? Are they based on um, uh, other things? And I mean, just from what I know about our ABAs, I think it's a little bit of everything. Some of them are, climate bands as you go north in the valley. Some of them are based on altitude. Some are based on um, uh, the cities kind of as you go up. So um, do you want to respond to that, uh, Keith or John? Um, I'll Howard? scroll back to the slide on the... Yeah. Okay. If I, can. I think at yeah, different so times when the federal government was recognizing the AVAs, they were considering different, different factors as being important. Um, so right. Keith? So there's, there's a lot of folks, sorry, Keith, were you going to no, go? go ahead, John. Um, so there's a lot of input when AVAs are being created. I mean, it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. And sometimes there's a lot of infighting, actually, of the folks that are within that AVA. So to the question, it's, it's kind of like, like you were saying, Connor, it, it's, a, it's all of the above plus. Um, sometimes it's political. Sometimes there's a hard um, geographic or actually a road that makes no sense, but there's a road going through. And so that's the might be the northern or southern or eastern or western border. Um, again, it really it, it depends on a lot of who is trying to create that AVA and the inputs that are put in to the government to get that approved. Agreed. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay, super. Well, I wanted to thank everybody who took time out of their day to join us. Uh, hopefully you're walking away with a little bit of a better understanding about just how diverse this region is, but also uh, hopefully a little bit of clarification on what the different areas give in terms of wine style. Uh, I want to thank Keith and John so much for getting up early. It's nicer for me in Montreal at 11 o'clock, uh, <laughs> getting up early to be with us today and give us share so much of your, your knowledge and your expertise. And um, on that note, have a wonderful rest of your day and looking forward to seeing everybody one day again soon when we can get off our screens. Great. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers.